Yes. Are you ready for the word? Yes. All righty, let's dig right on in. What are we talking about? Be, be salty. So today I'm going to get a little bit practical. I don't know how far we'll get, but we'll go as far as we can. And once my time runs out, we'll just keep on going like we normally do. Uh, uh, no, no, I won't do that. I probably will, but uh, so... Uh, um, but anyway, today I want to talk to you about salty flavor. Turn to your neighbor and say, salty flavor. I want to talk to you about what the flavor of salt, when it comes to the perspective of Jesus, really is like. And uh, so I don't want you to be licking on your neighbor to see if they're salty. That's not what we're talking about. Uh, we're really going to look at what the Word says. And look with me in Matthew 5 and verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its... Can you make it salty again? And we know you can, but not natural salt. It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as what? Yeah. Worthless. So if you don't have salty flavor according to Jesus, if you don't have the flavor of salt, that quality that you must have, then, then it is, there's not much value in it. Because the value of the salt is the fact that it is salt, it tastes like salt, it preserves like salt, and it, it's a change agent. How many of you understand when you apply salt, it brings change wherever it is? Have you ever put too much salt in something? Huh? I mean, if somebody says, no, way, you, can't, you can't put too much salt. But it, it, you can. And how many of you know when you oversaturate something, then it doesn't taste good? You just got to have the right amount. So that's very important. Well, it's the same with light. I mean, light guides us and shows us where to go. And having the right amount of light, that's a good thing. But if you take a flashlight and you put it right into somebody's face, how many of you know that's not good, right? So, so we need to understand this. There is a flavor that's necessary. And we're going to see what it is. And then Jesus goes on and he says, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a, a basket. That means we should not be hiding what we are doing. Instead, a lamp is placed on a what? Stand where it gives light to who? Everyone in the house. In the same way. Somebody say, in the same way. Say it again. So in the same way as this lamp gives light to a whole house, your good deeds must shine out for all to what? So that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Now I want to give you two quick thoughts as we start today. And that is, first of all, salt means I have God's character. Salt means I have God's character. I'll dig that out here in a moment. And light means I do the good works of Jesus. Salt means I have God's character. Light means I do the good works of Jesus. And we'll unwrap that maybe in a few weeks uh, if we uh, get to it. But I want to go back to Matthew chapter 5. And I want to continue now reading what Jesus said because it's going to tie in so we have an understanding of the salty flavor thing that we need to have. And then Jesus says this in Matthew 5, 17. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. Very important words. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. That is profound words. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, now we'll qualify what Jesus is saying because we know that Jesus is saying he came to fulfill the law, not to abolish the law. And the law in Jesus is fulfilled. When Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, that work was done. It was complete. Now watch this, what he says in verse 20, because he's going to make a statement that if you were a part of his Jewish audience on that mountain, this would have literally, uh, literally blown your mind. Jesus says this, look at verse 20. But I warn you, somebody say, I warn you. So it's a warning from Jesus. Notice these words. Unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, Jesus made a profound statement to his Jewish audience, and I want you to understand the context of this. He, he told them that their righteousness must exceed the righteousness, not just of others, but of the very teachers of the religious law, the, the, the rabbis, the scribes, the, the Pharisees. Now, if the first few verses about the Beatitudes wasn't shocking enough for them, how many of you know this more than probably pricked their ears and they really wanted to lean in and hear what Jesus has to say? 
more righteous than the teachers of righteousness. And, and this was for them, this was absolutely uh, almost an impossible statement to hear. Because for the Pharisees, righteousness had several components to it. And, and there's a, a word for it, it's called sadaka, and that, or, or tzedek, uh, or, or tzedek, and that's how you say it, it has a T in front of it. And that word kind of encompasses a whole bunch of stuff when it comes to righteousness. Uh, and, and part of that, it included the giving of arms, it included prayer, it included fasting, it included how you interact with other people, that means in relationships. And so Jesus is making the statement, he says the scribes and the Pharisees, their, their claim to fame is that they are righteous, and they are righteous because of the way they pray, the, the way that they give alms, the, the, the way that they fast, the, the way that they, that they say how they are interacting in their relationships. He says, you know, they, they are very righteous, but then Jesus said, if you think they are righteous, then I want to warn you that your righteousness must exceed their righteousness. How many of you know that must have absolutely blown their mind? Because, because we know that the scribes and Pharisees were, they literally wore the law on their, on their wrists and on their foreheads. They had the, I mean, it's kind of like they had it all over themselves. They recited it. They talked about it. They discussed it. I mean, they, they gave their whole lives to this whole thing that they would term righteousness. And now Jesus says to the, to the audience, he says, your righteousness must exceed their righteousness. That means if you think they are committed, you're going to have to be way more committed. Now, I want you to understand something. Why, why did, can Jesus infer? Why does he push in on this? And he says, here's what you got to understand. Their righteousness had a composure of, they act it out, but the validity of their righteousness is not there because they think you can have the act without the heart value. But I want you to know that if you're going to act out, you better have the heart value as well. That means your heart has to be in your righteousness, not just your action has to be in your righteousness. Now, the only way that we can get there, the only way that our righteousness can be right and more than the Pharisees is to understand that we cannot be self-righteous. How many of you know sometimes when we do good, we get self-righteous? Because we do good and Jesus wants us to understand and he wanted them to understand that he's not talking about a self-righteousness. He's talking about a righteousness that is in him because that's why he made the statement, I came to fulfill the law. So what are you saying? He's saying if you really want to understand righteousness and if your righteousness is going to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, then you are going to have to be in me because it's only in me that you can be more righteous than just on your own so it's a righteousness that is not listen to me now it's a righteousness that's not derived from a continued right action it is a righteousness that is derived from a heart that has been bathed and washed and that heart now acts in righteousness so it's not an act that forces me to do it is a heart that's now changed and therefore i want to do are, are you are you tracking with me now, let me give you, and you say, well, Henny, why do you say this? Because I want you to just listen to this, and you can check it up uh, later on when you're home, when you do your Bible study. You'll find that in, in the Sermon of the Mount, right after Jesus says this, the very next thing, and we've dealt with this a couple of weeks ago, Jesus proceeds to deal with anger. And remember that he says, you, you know, he says, you know, the, 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 the Jews said you can throw out words, you, you call your brother Raka, but anybody remember that? He says, but I warn you that if you get mad without a cause, you are, you're in danger of hellfire. Can anybody remember that? And Jesus talked about that prison of resentment. So then he deals with anger. And every time Jesus would deal with something, he would start it off like this. He would start, the, he would say this, you have heard it said, but I say unto you every time. So Jesus says, you've heard it said, and then so he deals with anger, then he deals with adultery. And then he says, you've heard it said, and then Jesus raised the ante. Every time, every time he, he states the law you know, about committing adultery, then Jesus says, I want you to know this, that it's actually higher than the act of adultery. Whoever looks upon a woman... How many of you know looking is, for us, is way not as bad as doing, but Jesus says why? Because adultery is the thing that starts in the heart, not just in the act. You've already done it when your heart has already purpose to think about it. So he, that's why he's saying that your righteousness has got to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Why? Because the holiness that you need to have is not birthed from an action. The holiness is birthed in the heart that has been washed and cleansed through Christ Jesus and identifying with him. 
So he deals with divorce, then he deals with vows, then he deals with revenge, then he deals with the treatment of en enemies, then he deals with the giving of alms, then he deals with prayer, then he deals with fasting and possessions and all the things that the teachers of the religious law used to brag about, Jesus deals with. And he deals with it in such a way to let us know that our righteousness can exceed their righteousness, not because we do more than they do, but we identify now with the one who, the only one who is righteous, and his name is Jesus. That's why the Bible says, You have become the righteousness of God, where? In Christ Jesus. For God made him who knew no sin, sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So to have the flavor of salt, we must be like Jesus. Thank you for your enthusiasm, Tori, I'll take it. Because they ain't saying nothing. To have the flavor of salt, we must be like Jesus. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm going to start spiritual, but I'm going to take it practical. Are, are you okay with that? Look, now, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, and let's dig this out, this thought out today, and I hope it'll uh, help you. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1, very well-known verses. Listen to how Paul starts this. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? And obviously the answer should be, Absolutely. Any comfort from his love? You bet. Any fellowship together in the spirit? Hello? Yes. Give me a yes. So when I pause, I'm waiting for a response, all right? So let's try this again. I got to reteach you this. So let's try this. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Now listen to this. Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Yes. <laughs> That's not a very confident yes. Oh. <laughs> well, maybe. You know, we can go with the other ones because God does that. Well, we don't know about this one. But I, 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 need you, I need you to see this verse because I need you to understand that Paul starts with what Jesus is to us, what God is to us, what Christ is to us, and then he moves very, uh, very closely to who we are. He says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? We know absolutely. Is there any comfort of his love? That's stuff that God does for me. So he encourages me, he loves me, and then, then guess what? He now expands it. So watch what the verse does. It grows. Then he says, any fellowship together in the Spirit? So it starts with what God has done for me. Now watch what God has done for us as we fellowship where? In the Spirit. And then he says, then he says okay, if, we, if you're saying, if you make the statement, we are fellowshipping in the Spirit... If we say, well, we're in the Spirit, then he says, when you're in the Spirit, then guess what is going to happen to your heart? Your heart is going to be tender and compassionate. Okay? He says that, and, and then now watch. Now he's going to, so he's going to take that, and then he's going to take this thought, and he's going to br bring it out. Watch this, verse 2. Then make me truly happy by what? Agreeing. Agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working how? Together with what? One mind and purpose. That's we, the church. Then he goes on and he says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Listen to this. Be what? Humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. He didn't say that you have a choice in this. He said you must have it. So he, he comes with this, this understanding of who we are and what we are and recognizing that if we really say that the Spirit of God is among us, then it's going to look like this. This is what it's going to be. There's going to be a wholehearted agreement that we are going to be tender towards one another, loving towards one another. We are going to be working together with one purpose and one mind. Why? Because we are not going to be selfish. No one is pushing for their own agenda. Why? Because we're not trying to impress anybody. We are going to prefer others above ourselves. How many of you would love to be part of a community like that. Yeah. Now, I want you to understand this. Yes, we say, yes, we want it, but Paul is not talking about you want it. He's saying you must be it. Yeah. 
You see, sometimes we want something, but we are unwilling to change to be the thing we want. We want friendship, but we are unwilling to pay the price for friendship. We want relationship. We want somebody to love us and be there for us and support us, but we are unwilling to reciprocate that for someone else first. You see, we want others to come to us. We don't want to come to them. And Paul says, that's not how it works. Why? Because when you have the attitude of Christ, you will find out that Christ came to us. No, don't clap. Don't throw money. Anything, I'm going to show you this. Are, are you still there? Are you okay with this? I don't have another sermon. This is it, all right? Now watch this. Though he was God, verse 6, though he was God, talking about Jesus, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine what? Privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, listen to these words, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. And because of this action that Jesus took, therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So to have, the, to have this flavor of salt, we must possess the right attitude and the attitude that we must possess, and you have got to understand this, until you have the right attitude, the right action will not mean anything. You see why? And the right attitude enables me to have the right action. If I'm going to identify, if we are saying in this room, if we are saying online that we belong to Christ Jesus, if we call ourselves Christ followers and we call ourselves Christians, then there has to be a quality about us that has to be absolutely different than who we were, than what we were, and whatever other identi identities we embrace, we do not embrace those anymore. Why? Because our identification now is in Christ first and foremost. So if our identity is in Him because of what He has done for us, then therefore now we have that righteousness that only God can give. That righteousness is a gift that we get from being under the umbrella or under the authority or under the covering of the one who laid His life down for us. And so therefore the attitude that we adopt is not an attitude of self-righteousness. I'm good just because I'm good. No, it is an attitude of understanding that there is right and and there is wrong, there is morals, whether you like it or not, and that morals is not just out there in Wawa land, you know, for anybody to determine, no, 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 if you want to find out how it looks like, you look at Jesus. You see, uh, listen to me now, as Christ followers, we are not looking to anything else or anybody else as an example, Christ is our primary example. If Christ is my primary example and I have the same attitude as Christ, meaning that even if I have an elevated position, that elevated position is nothing to cling to, hold on to, but I have to be willing to lay it down. Why? Because that's called humility. Church, can I say this to you? And I'm going to say it to you. You need to understand. We do not understand the power of humility that is available to us because what we have done, we think when you are humble, you are weak, but that's not true. It actually is only the strong that can be humble. It is only a person that knows who they are when they are being ostracized for something that they are not that will not retaliate. When I know who I am... When I know who I am in Christ Jesus and you accuse me of anything else, it doesn't move me. Why? Because I know my primary identity. I am a son of God. I belong to the king. I am born again. That is my primary identity. And it's in him that I stand. In his righteousness I stand. And through his power I stand. 
and therefore I can identify something that's wrong and something that's right because I don't just have a free moral code roaming around in the universe. No, no, no. It is written on my heart by him who saved me. Because I have adopted an attitude of humility by laying down my life and trusting God will give me what I think I need. Because he doesn't end with Jesus being in the lowest position. He ends with Jesus getting all the glory. And I, I need, I need you, uh, you, you're not getting this, but I'll keep on messing with you until you do. Uh, here's what you have to understand. Let, let's dig this out. He says God gave him the name that's above every name. You have a name? His name's above yours. You have an identity? His name's above your identity. Hola. So we have names, his name's above us. But he doesn't just say of those on earth, he says of those in heaven. That means any authority, any angel, any power, any ruler, any, doesn't matter who it is, his name is above that. But he doesn't stop there, he says of those under the earth. So it doesn't matter if there's, if there's evil rulership or good rulership, the name of Jesus is above it. And the reason the name of Jesus is above it, because he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he stripped himself. That means he made that conscious decision. He stripped himself and made himself of no reputation, coming in the likeness of man, in the form of a servant or a slave, as Paul mentions it, in the form of a slave. That means he was willing to be treated not the way that he deserved. He was willing to be treated as one that he does not deserve. Why? Because he humbled himself of obedience even to the point of death on the cross. Even though that obedience in the natural cost him his very life, he was willing to do it. I, I, I need you to hear what I'm going to say. If you're going to go God's way, it is not the easy way. It is not, listen to me, this is not little, little pablum that's going to make you feel better. It's not going to do that. No, no, no. This is for them, those moments where you get accused. This is for those moments when you want to retaliate. This is for that moment when you want to strike back. This is for that moment when you want to say things you shouldn't say. This is for those moments that you realize, hey, I've laid down my life and I've adopted his life and therefore my response should be that of Christ, not of my own. So, so I'm almost out of time and I, that's not even the introduction, but... So let, let, let me give you a few thoughts on the flavor of Christ-like saltiness, okay? So what does this look like in, in practice? The Word's going to tell us so we don't have to wonder. I, I want to take you uh, to a place in Ephesians chapter 3 that we, we love these verses, but then we stop, and then we stop reading, and then we think a, a new thought has started, but it doesn't. So I'm going to take you back to take you forward. Is that Okay. So we're going to be in Ephesians 3 and then in Ephesians 4, and we'll see how far we can get uh, before you guys can't handle it anymore, right? So uh, look, look at this, Ephesians 3, and let's do verse 20. Are you still with me? Yes. Online, are you still with me? Yes. They are? Okay, good. Why well, You said, yeah, for them, you guys are awesome. <laughs> you online too, that's amazing. Yeah. Okay, look at this, Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now all glory to who? God, who is able through His mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Okay, so that is amazing. That's an amazing verse. But we use that verse for our new Cadillac and our new home, but it's got nothing to do with our new Cadillac and our new home. Are you with me? It's got to do with our new identity, not our new Cadillac. All right? I, I, I don't mind you having a new Cadillac. I'm just saying this is... This is not what it's talking about, all right? Maybe you need another verse. But anyway, verse 21. Glory to Him. Oh, yes, that glory thing. Glory to Him where? In the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so we think, okay, he said, I'm in, it means it's done. But now, in Ephesians 4, verse 1, that's Ephesians 3, 20, 21. Now, let's pick up the next chapter. Watch what he says. Therefore, okay, so therefore what? Therefore, because what I just told you, that all glory to God, that He's able to do what we cannot do for ourselves, that His mighty power is working on the inside of us to accomplish infinitely far more than we can ask or think. 
uh, uh, he says glory to him, and because of that, glory to him where? In the church. Somebody say in the church. Are you the church? That means in you, in us, all right? Okay, now watch what he says in verse 1. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life that's what? Worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. So he say, the glory is to him. He says, and we now have been called to live a particular way. And the reason we are called to live a particular way is because we want to give glory to him and glory to him in the church. And then he says, listen, you need to understand to live that particular way. If you think you're not able, you need to know you are because God is able. Somebody say, God is able. Why? Because of his mighty power that's working where? In me. Somebody say, in me. To accomplish far more than I can ask or think. So maybe you're praying, say, God, help me. And you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm flipping my lid. God, I'm, I'm losing it in anger. God, and he says, hey, no, no matter what it is that you ask for or want for, you need to know this, that there's power on the inside of you that is resonant. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you because of your new identity. And now you have the power to live the way that God wants you to live. And Paul says, I beg you that you live a life worthy. Somebody say, worthy. Worthy of what? Worthy of the calling. What is the calling? To be like Jesus. And then he's going to give us some ways that we can identify how it looks like. Are you ready? How about this side over here? Did you guys have a tough week? Is that what it is? I'm sorry. Watch. Verse 2. Always be what? And be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. Wow. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. Now, let's take some practical thoughts from these verses of what it looks like if you and I are going to have Christ flavor, if we're going to have the flavor of Christ, if we're going to have the identity of Christ in us. Here's the first one, humility. Did you notice that? Always be humble. All right? So that, that humility is the very thing that we learn that Jesus had. It's the very thing that we need to learn that we ought to have. And humility is, is not, a, it's not a, a, a quality. It's a quality we admire, but we usually admire it in someone else. We don't mind somebody else being humble. We just don't want to humble ourselves. Listen to me, church. We overcome the enemy through humility, not power. The power to be and the power to do is found in humility. The word humility means to be grounded. And honestly, another, 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 as we get a root word, our root word for for uh, humor actually comes from humility. So when you are able to laugh at yourself, Amen. some of you need to look in the mirror <laughs> if you're struggling. But that's, that's what humor is. It's the ability to not take yourself too seriously. You take God very seriously, but you don't take yourself too seriously because therefore when you take yourself too seriously, you are going to be so focused on what you're not getting and what you need to have that now you're going to get angry at others because you, you get something that you perceived you are not should, you should not get and you, you don't receive something that you perceive you want to get, but yet humility says, uh, you know, I, I can, I, sometimes I just do silly stuff. Humility is the ability, humility is the ability to confess your faults because you understand not only your strengths, you also understand your weaknesses. Humility doesn't hide. Humility, when, 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 when a person of humility, when you say, hey, you were wrong, they're like, hey, you know what, you're right, man. I, I, I was, that was pretty dumb, wasn't it? I do some dumb things sometimes. I just laugh at myself. 
How many of you know that's way better than somebody, what, what do they do? They start doing, the be, I mean, they do the best defense lawyer work on the planet. No, but you don't understand. There are extenuating circumstances for what I have done. Your Honor, let me just, uh, let me, let me plead my case. And usually the case that we plead has to do with, you see, it's, the, it's other people. You do not understand. When I was two years old, my daddy dropped me on my head. And from that day, so we blame our daddies. We, we blame our, what, what, what's happened to us. We blame everything else because we refuse to accept responsibility for where we are, what we are, and we refuse to understand that the attitude we possess, as, listen to me, the attitude you possess is not one that anybody gave you, it's one that you've chosen. You choose your attitude. And when people come alongside of you and try to help you get out of that muck, that's why you repeat the same cycle in your life over and over again. Why is it? Because you cannot have a changed life without having a changed thought. And if you do not identify, if you do not identify the pattern of thinking in your heart and mind, you will never be able to change. Humble. Humility. He didn't say, when it is convenient, be humble. Always be humble. So right now, you need to be humble. What is humility? Humility is the ability to receive that which you do not rightly deserve. So humility, it's the same way. You, you know how you get saved? By humility acknowledging that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. If you don't humble yourself, you can't be saved. Are, are you with me, somebody? So that's the very first act that leads you. The, the Bible tells us very clearly in this. But when we bring it down in relationships, is that it, I, I don't know why it is that we have this pecking attitude in our hearts and minds, and then we, we weigh it. Well, you know, they not, I'm more important than them, and because I'm more important than them, they need to serve me. But that's not the way, that's not the way of Christ Jesus. That's not your new identity. Your new identity is the willingness to serve whoever. As a matter of fact, let, let me press this a little bit. It's not just serving the ones you love. It's even serving the ones who's against you. It's easy to be humble with humble people. It's not easy to be humble when people are arrogant towards you. How many of you know when somebody gives you an arrogant attitude? And they, and they just, they keep on doing that. What, what, what is our natural tendency? Come on, work with me, church. You know this. What is our natural tendency? We stiffen our neck. Mm. You gave me that? Well, bless God, dabble, double, battle, bam, bam, bam. You think you can think quick on your feet, sucker? Let me show you. Not you guys. Second service. <laughs> the reason we are bringing them with you in August is so that they can see what spiritual people really looks like. <laughs> I'm so out of time. And I'm not even on the second one. <sighs> Always be humble. Look at this. You will be back. <laughs> You sure about it? <laughs> I know you will be back because you're humble. And watch this. Gentleness. Always be humble and... How many of you know that humility and gentleness go hand in hand? But again, the, our gentleness gets pressed and our gentleness is proven when other people are not gentle. See, like, let me give you an illustration. You guys will get this if you have a dog and you like it. Um, my dog, my dog Daisy, is probably one of the most gentle dogs on the planet. She's just, she's probably lazy too, but she's very, very gentle. And, and it's easy to be gentle with Daisy because she's always gentle with everybody. She's gentle, she's kind, she's humble, she's meek. And so it's not a problem 
it's not a problem to reciprocate, right? But how many of you know, not everybody acts like Daisy. I think if we treated one another like Daisy treats everybody, I think we'll be a very happy world, but we don't. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, Daisy is happy with her. I mean, if I come home this afternoon after church, she'll, she'll be like so happy to see me. She'll be like, where have you been? I've missed you. My whole life is about pleasing you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm so happy. I'm so happy you're in my world. Now feed me. You know, I mean. <laughs> so the, the, the reality of this, of this gentleness, it's a gentleness that's rooted in humility. Why does my gentleness have to be rooted in humility? Because the moment you separate the two, how many of you know when somebody is stern with us, what do we, it's natural to what? Fight. To fight. It's natural to want to, it's na that's, a, that's a natural response. But you've got to understand, that's why we are leaning on the power of God that can do that which we cannot do on my own. I cannot do it except by supernatural Holy Spirit power. So I'm leaning not on who I was, I'm leaning on who He is. And because when I lean on who he is, and that helps me not only to uh, adopt the identity, but it helps me to humble myself, and then it helps me to be gentle with those who deserve it and those who even don't deserve it. Jesus never retaliate in any way. He never hit back. Are you with me, somebody? Now, he doesn't mean he didn't speak the truth. He spoke the truth, but that truth was a truth spoken, needed to be spoken to produce the change. I'm not saying we acquiesce and this is not giving in to every moral thing. This is not what we are talking about. We are talking about in the essence of who we are as human beings that we ought to be gentle with one another. We ought to be humble with one another. And it looks how? Look at the very next phrase. Making what? allowances for each other's faults because of your love. So he says this. He says we are humble, we are gentle, and then he goes on and he says be what? Patient with each other. Are you there? This shouldn't be this difficult. The flavor of salt is humility, gentleness, patience. Be patient with each other. How do I know I'm patient with another person? It's when we make allowances for other people's mistakes. Let's, we live in the real world, right? Anybody live in the real world? Anybody have had anybody make a mistake? Well, let's talk about you first of all. Have you ever made a mistake? You, I should have had a better amen than that. Have you ever made a mistake? We all have, right? Paul is saying, he says, when we have this humility and this gentleness, he says, here's what we do. We make allowance. Somebody say allowance. allowance. Now, as a kid, maybe you got allowance, maybe you didn't get allowance, maybe as a grown-up you're getting allowance, I don't know. But uh, 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 allowance, what, what does an allowance mean? Allowance means you get what? You get something that you can use on whatever you want. You, it's allowed for. All right? It's allowed for. That means, so, so what, what Paul is saying in our relations with one another, and you, you take it in marriage, you take it whoever, doesn't matter whoever you're in a relationship with, here's what we do. We know this. We, because we know we mess up, we know they mess up, and because we know there's going to be mess ups, what do we do? We allow. We make allowance. So, so why do we make allowance? So that we don't, what, jump on one another's faults. Hey, stop doing that. You always do that. No, no, no. We say we're going to make allowance. And here's what we do, folks. I, I need you to understand this. We make allowance for one another's faults so that we can do what? So that we can go to God in prayer and pray that God will minister to the heart of somebody. And let me say this. When you are patient with somebody, you've got to understand it's going to tap your patience. Patience is a virtue that, that, that is needed, but it's a virtue that's always tested. And when you pray, when you say, God, give me more patience, how many of you know what he's going to do? He's going to put people around you that's going to now work on you to get more patience. Why? Because the way you get more patience is you grow the allowance. So you don't just say, well, you do that, you do that once more. You know what I'm saying? That's no allowance, right? 
You've got to have a little bit of grace and a little bit of gentleness. So you allow, you, you make an allowance. Why? Because you are allowing. What are you doing? Why are you doing that? You are allowing, and when you allow, you allow God to do the work. Mm. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. Because there's so much more. But I needed to get somewhere. Can, can you give me 10 minutes? Are you sure? You, you sure you give me 10 minutes? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip over a lot. Because you, you just can't handle all of it. Actually, no, I'm not going to do that. No skipping. So watch this. Let's finish this flavor of salt. Somebody say humility. humility. Somebody say gentleness. gentleness. Somebody say patience. patience. Somebody say it's make allowance make allow. for others' faults. For others faults. The next one he says, unity. He says make every effort. Somebody say make every effort. Make every watch effort. this. To keep what? Yeah. Unity where? In the spirit. Unity in the spirit. Then he says, watch this. Peaceable. Make every effort to be bound together by what? Peace, that's in verse 3. And then he goes and he talks about oneness. Remember the principle of one, verses 4 to verses 6. One body, one spirit, one glorious hope, one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all and in all, living through all. And then he talks about placement. What placement? We are each given a specific gift. Do not negate Christ's gift generosity by ignoring the gift he gave you. So, so here's the flavor of salt all put together. The flavor of salt is a person that with humility and grace are always able to be gentle. They are patient with other people's faults. Why? Because they realize they make faults of their own. So they allow for certain things to happen. Why? Because they are endeavoring. That means they are working hard. And what are they working hard? They are working hard to keep the unity. Why? Because they know the unity is in a response to the power of the Spirit. Because they know when we are one in the Spirit, there is power to break the chains that is necessary and then they make every effort to have a bond of what? Peace. That means they are peacemakers. They are determined to reconcile. They are determined to forgive. They are determined to let go. They are determined to say there are certain things it doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong, but my righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, and therefore I'm leaning on the power of the Spirit on the inside of me. Why? Because there's one God, one Father, one baptism, one Lord, one God over all, in us all, and working through us all. And because of that, He places me in a specific place and gives me placement in the body for His glory. So that why? So that I can have the flavor of salt in my life. Because if I lose my saltiness, I cannot influence anybody for his glory. And that's what I want to do. Shall we bow our heads and pray? Let's do that right now. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus and we acknowledge that we need you. We acknowledge that there's only one God, one Lord, one Father of our all, one Spirit, one baptism, one Savior. Jesus, we ask you that you would give us the strength. We want to have your attitude. We want to humble ourselves and give ourselves. Lord, sometimes we think it's so hard, but it's because we are not leaning on what you've given us, and that's the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are the divine teacher. So we pray that you show us, teach us. Teach us so that we can have the flavor of salt so that we will not lose our flavor, so that we can make the impact that's necessary, not only for those outside, but those close to us, so that those that know us truly know that we love you and serve you, and that your character flows through us. Well, every head is bowed and every eye closed. If you're here this morning, online, in service, outside, but you've never made a confession of your faith in Christ Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity. Maybe you say, well, Henny, I'm a good person. Listen, the Bible says our good works is like filthy rags before the Lord. It's not how good you are. 
People come with this idea, well, you know, Henny, maybe there's, you know, maybe there's no such thing as good or evil. Maybe there's no morals. What bus did you fall off? Because if that's true, then Jesus was out of his mind to let us know that our righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees who were pretty righteous. You see, here's what you got to know. There is wrong, there is right. There is sin in this world. We are living in a broken world. We're living in a world that without God, it is hell-bent on going in the wrong direction. So I don't care what you've done. I don't care if you say, well, any, I, I go to church. It doesn't matter if you go to church. But coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. It's like me standing in a garage. It doesn't make me a car. Swimming in a lake, it doesn't make me a trout. You cannot become a Christian through osmosis. Don't think you're a Christian because your daddy is a Christian, your mommy is a Christian, or, or, or your grandpappy, or your grandmammy. Well, guess what? God has no grandchildren. He only has children. And you have to come to that place in your life where you yourself acknowledge Him. First of all, know who you are. Know that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And until you do that, I don't care what good works you do. I don't care how good you act. I don't care how you smile. I don't care how you give money to the poor. It does not matter one bit whatsoever. You see, you have a sin-sick soul that the only remedy is the blood of Jesus Christ. And it is only then that what you need to understand, that change can happen. There is right, there is wrong. There is a moral code by which we live. And that is determined not by ourselves, but as determined by what God showed and revealed to us. Where did God reveal himself? Through his son, Christ Jesus. Therefore, we need a revelation of Jesus. You need to know who Jesus is, because if you know who Jesus is, then you know you cannot save yourself, that only he can save you. And then in humility, you cry out, God, save me. Save me from myself. That's called salvation. That's called to be born again. And he gives you the faith to believe, to trust him. It's a gift from him. And he gives you the grace. It's a gift from him. He gives you the grace to have saving faith. So that you know, for it is not by works that you are saved, but by grace. And that is a gift of God. So today, in this room, Online, if you've never made a confession of your faith, then I'm going to give you that opportunity to do it right now. And I want to pray with you. If that's you and you say, Henny, that's me, would you pray with me? Then just go ahead right now, online, outside, indoor, just pop your hand up, let me see it. Just pop it up high. Thank you, 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 thank you. I see that. Thank you, thank you. God bless you. Thank you. I see that. God bless you. Anybody else just pop it up, say, Henny, that's me. Please pray for me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I see that, thank you. God bless you, thank you. I see that. Let me lead you in a prayer. There's no magic in this prayer. It's just a way of committing our hearts to Him. And uh, I'm going to ask the church if you would please stand with me. If you're at home, do the same. Just stand up. And I'm going to pray this prayer. As I say, there's no magic. This, this is not an abracadabra, but it is a way of bringing our hearts before the Lord. Would you pray with me right now? Say this. Say, Lord Jesus. I confess that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus, thank you for humbling yourself and becoming obedient, even obedience to the point of death. Death on the cross. You shed your blood so I can be forgiven. Today, I receive your gift of grace, of mercy, of forgiveness. I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe with my heart that God has raised you from the dead and you are alive. Come now and live in me. I thank you my past is forgiven and forgotten, washed away by the blood of Jesus. From this day, I want to follow you and no other. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If you believe that, give the Lord a clap offering that he is worthy of it.